Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I read a book recently by A.W. Tozer that really spoke to something in my life and I had kind of been pondering about it. And so when I had the opportunity to to share today, I was like, well, I think I'll, I'll talk about that. And, um, and of course, God confirmed that, hey, this is definitely what we should be talking about today. And so I titled this, To Revere God in Your Heart. And when I looked up revere in the Webster Dictionary, I found this definition. It says, to show devoted deferential honor to, regard as worthy of great honor honor. And we'll look at another definition from the Greek and Hebrew a little bit later. But Tozer, he had a a comment on a statement out of John chapter 5, verse 44, that really stood out to me. And in this conversation, Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and he makes this statement to them. He says, how can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. And so Toza goes on, he makes this statement about that. He says, if I understand this correctly, Christ taught here the alarming doctrine that the desire for honor among men made belief impossible. Is this sin at the root of religious unbelief? Could it be that those intellectual Difficulties which men blame for their inability to believe are but smoke screens to conceal the real cause that lies behind them. Was it this greedy desire for honor from man that made men into Pharisees and Pharisees into those who killed God? Is this the secret behind religious self-righteousness and empty worship? I believe it may be. The whole course of life is upset by failure to put God where he belongs. We exalt ourselves instead of God, and the curse follows. And when I read that, it really made me just reflect on my relationship with God. And I pray that's our experience today, too. So the question for us today is, do we have God where he belongs in our heart? That's our question for us to ponder today. Are there things in our life that we put before God? When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he said that the Pharisees saw the glory of people. And when you look up that word glory, it means He's, they saw their opinion of other people. They saw the praise of other people. They saw the honor of other people. They saw all those things from people instead of seeking it from God, instead of seeking the glory that God has for them. God wants to be preeminent in our hearts today. And when I say that, I mean he wants to surpass anything else in our life. God would not be second. He would not play second fiddle in our lives. He won't let anybody else, anything else, fit that space where he belongs in our life. So the question is, do we have God in our hearts where he belongs? 1 Peter 3 hits on that as well. 1 Peter 3 verses 13 through 15, it reads, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So Peter says that in our hearts, we should revere Christ as Lord. And some translation says to sanctify. 
And when you look that up, what it means is to make holy or to consecrate. And it also means to, to separate from things profane and dedicated and dedicate it to God. So Peter is saying that we should separate our hearts for God. That's what he's saying here. And in this context, how it's written here, Peter's actually, he's talking to the church that's been dispersed, who's been going through persecution. But he's telling them, even though you're going through those things, revere Christ in your heart. Because there will be opportunities. Let people know of the hope that you have within you. That's the context of it. For today, we're looking at an application. We're looking at the importance of having God where he should be in our hearts. So we're going to look at two different things that can happen when we don't revere God in our heart. And the first one is our obedience to God can be hindered if he's not in the right place in our lives. And the second is our belief can also be hindered if God is not seated in the the right place. So let's look at the first one. So not revering God in our hearts will affect our obedience. How can we do what God has called us to do if he's not Lord? How are we going to do that? Jesus says it this way in Luke 6.46. He says, why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus tells the people, if I am Lord of your life, you would do what I tell you to do. And if you don't do what I tell you to do, am I really Lord of of your life? God examines our heart. He looks at the motives. He sees right down in into the very core of who we are. And when we talk about heart today, we're not talking about, you know, the heart feeling. We always go, oh, heart. We're talking about our, our mind. We're talking about our wills and our emotions. We're talking about the very essence of who we are. It's more than a feeling. And for us, not wanting the glory of, of God and, and seeking the glory of of man, King Saul was uh, an example of, of wanting glory from people more than glory from God. We're going to look at a passage in 1 Samuel 15, verses 20 through 24. And I got to give a little context to this because I didn't get the whole chapter. It would just be too much for today. But what's going on here is that God gives King Saul a command to go and just obliterate the Malachites. Don't bring back anything. That's his his job. You go over there and you take everything out. I don't want anything coming back. They're just just wicked. Take them out completely. So that's his, his charge. He doesn't do that. And so the prophet here, Samuel, is going to go and and he's going to talk to King Saul and And he's going to confront him on that. So here, where we pick up at, we find King Saul responding to Samuel the prophet. Verse 20 says, But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag the king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violate the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me 
so that I may worship the Lord. Saul cared more about what people thought about him than what God thought about him. And if, as you look through Saul's life, it was all about him. It was either, either wanting to be praised in front of the people, wanting to get glory from people, or the kingdom, the Israeli kingdom. It's, it, was, it was his kingdom. That's how he saw it. The story was always about Saul in a nutshell. It wasn't about, it wasn't about God. For us, sometimes if we can, if we don't put God in the right place, we can move him out of the place where he should be in our hearts as well. We have to be careful about that. We can desire to be favored by people instead of seeking the favor of God. Not revering God as Lord can keep us from doing what we know God is asking us to do. So, this is a rhetorical question. I don't expect any responses today, but what are some things you know that God has asked us to do? What is keeping you, obey, that's good. What is keeping us from accomplishing those things? Could it be that we simply don't have God in a position in our hearts where he's supposed to be. And I thought about this too. I, was, I thought about sometimes we have like flat out told God no. We have, are there some things that we have put limits on? Like God, I'll, I'll serve you here, but I'm not going to do that. It's as if we've put limitations on, on what God, what we'll allow God to do in our life. That's not the way the relationship works between, between us and God. It is not. So for us, do we have God in the right place where he's supposed to be in our hearts? The second is our belief in God can be hindered by not revering God in our hearts. Jesus said the Pharisees had a difficult time believing in him because they wanted the praise of men. They always wanted to be in, in a place of, of honor. They always wanted uh, recognition. For us, we must put our trust in God alone and not in people. If we're putting our trust in people, we're selling ourselves short. And why is that? Because God alone is our help. God alone is our help. We're not going to find help in people. God is our redeemer. God is our healer. He's our restorer. Our life is in Christ. And no one can fill that spot that's designed for God. No one's going to be able to fill that role. And if we try to put any person in there or anybody else or anything at all, we're setting ourselves up for fail, failure. And I know last week we had um, adult teen challenge here and just hearing their testimonies, it kind of goes along with the same thing. Just putting things in, in a space where God should be. And sometimes we can even compare ourselves with, with other people as well. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 12 through 13, the Apostle Paul talks about that. And he says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with someone, with some who condemn, who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. 
So we should not compare ourselves with anyone else. We shouldn't. We shouldn't be looking and say, hey, I'm, I'm okay because I'm in line with, with this person or uh, I'm doing better because uh, I'm not as bad as, as that. Um, and, and Jesus made that analogy about um, a Pharisee once in the scriptures. And the Pharisee was saying, oh, I thank the Lord I'm not like this person, you know, and uh, I don't do these things. And, and on, on the other side, this one person that was just awful, you know, he was crying out with a broken heart. And, and God said, who went home today, you know, having their, their, their sins forgiven? He talked about that, that wretched person. We're grateful for the people that are in our life. We are. But the people that are in our life, they are not our life. And Jesus makes this, this perfectly clear in Luke 14 at verse 25 when he makes this statement. He says, the text says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciples. And I know that's a very tough, tough statement to hear, but we always have to put scripture in context. So for most of us here in America, if we give our hearts to the Lord, we don't have to leave our home. We don't have to, um, our life isn't in threat, so to speak. But that's not true for every, every place around the world. The gospel that we have now is, the gospel is not for, for just America. It's for the Muslim nation, it's for the Buddhist nation, it's for the atheist regions, it's for every corner of this earth. And those things are happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ all the time. And that's why we should be praying for them. We should be praying for the church, for the people that are being, for the persecuted church, we should be praying for them. Because those things are their reality. For us, however, our persecution looks more like, well, uh, I can't fit into this group. Um, they don't like me so much. Our jobs may be on the line. If there's an ethical situation that's happening and, and, and the Holy Spirit is just prompting like, hey, you shouldn't be a part of that. But by and large, our, our lives are not on the line here in America. God doesn't want us to be separate from our, our families. He, he gave us our families. God is love. However, there could be times in our life that there could be choices. You know, people may put an option out there for you. Hey, you know, if you, if you, if you take God, then you're going to have to leave me. So this statement right here, I, I, want, it, I want it to all kind of resonate with us. And the statement is, ultimately... We have to ask ourselves, if Jesus is all we have, is he enough? I want to repeat that again. Ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus is all we have, is he enough? And if he's not enough, what's competing with that space? If we answer that question and we look in our peripheral and there's something there, what is it? What's fighting for that space that only God can fill in our life? Because God may give us an Abraham test, to be honest with you. He may bring some things. He may challenge some things in our life. And the wonderful story about Abraham is that when Abraham surrendered his son, in this case to be sacrificed, God gave him his son back. God gave him Isaac back. So what we take away from that is when we put God in the right place, God put things in order for us. He will, but he has to be preeminent in our lives. And we have to take a look and see what, what's there, what's fighting for that space. So you say, hey, brother, that's good. You know, we've got to 
revere God so we can stay on course and be obedient. We've got to revere God so we can, our beliefs can be right. How do we do that? So we have three things we're going to look at to help us to do that today. And the first one is, is to seek the Lord. God wants to hear from us. In Matthew 6, very familiar passage, 31 through 33, it says, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. God is telling us to go to him, to seek him. He's the one with the answer. God is our, he's our counselor. When we're spending time with God, he will comfort us. He's our healer. He's our provider. The things that we're looking for in life are found in Christ. We're not going to find them in, we're not going to find them in people. We simply are not. So we have to go to God. We have to seek him. The next thing is we have to use the word of God as a ballast for our life. And the verse we have that's going with this is Proverbs 4. Verses 20 through 23. And it says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not, do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them. And health to, the ones, to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. I looked up the word ballast, just, it just came to my head, you know, um, that's what the word of God is, it's like a ballast to us. But when I looked it up, I found this definition, it says, a heavy substance such as rocks or water placed in such a way as to improve stability and control. I was like, I can't think of a better definition. The word of God gives us stability. As we relinquish our life, as we follow him, as we make him a ballast for our life, it gives us that firm foundation. We just sung about it today. He's a firm foundation. And we cannot step away God from his word. They're all one. And when we put it, when we lay in that foundation, we have stability for our lives. And so with that, as we're making him, the word of God, a ballast for us, we have to measure our opinions with God's truth. What are the things that we think are okay? You know, what's, what's acceptable? What's like not acceptable? How does that measure out with the word of God? How does, how does that look in God's view? We have to measure our opinion and our views on God's word. The next thing is, we have to take God at his word. We have to believe that God's word is inerrant. Heaven and earth can pass away. That's what Jesus said. But his word will not pass away. It's going to remain. The things that God says are going to come to pass. You can take that to the bank. It's going to happen. Whatever he says, it's, it's going to go forth and it's going to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent, and that's in our lives. We have to take God at his word. If he said it, he meant it, and it's going to come to pass. The next thing is we have to act on God's word. It doesn't do us any good to, to take God's word in but not apply it. It doesn't. We can't be forgetful here. So that's what James was talking about. We have to actually implement it. God gives us the he gives us the plan. He gives us the game plan, but we have to execute it. 
We got to carry it out in order, in order for us to see the fruit of, of that in our lives. And the last thing, we have to trust, we have to trust the Lord. We have to trust that He's, he's good. And with that, we have Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 14. And this is one of my favorite passages. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Church, somehow God just works things out for our good. That's Romans 8 and 28. We have to trust that. We got to trust that God is good. If we as people know how to do good things, don't God know how to do good things? He does. And we got to trust that. We got to trust that he knows what's best for us. God's way is always going to be better than our way. It will always be. God knows. He says he knows what we ask. He knows what we need even before we ask. He already knows what's, what we need even before we ask. The thing about it is sometimes we want things right away but God is, he's forging out a relationship within us. There's a saying that waiting time is, is not wasted time. And that's true. While we're sitting and, and we're waiting on God, we're learning to spend time with him. But God is working on his own timeline. He's Lord. He's not going to give anything half-baked. When it's ready, it's, it's going to be right. And we have to trust that in that time, God is working that relationship out in our lives. We're getting to, to know his voice. We're getting to understand his heart, really. And he changes us in that. I want to say a prayer for us. I really felt prompted to, to pray for us when I was... Preparing this, I started thinking about the heart and, and really the things that we go through in life. We go through disappointment. We go through hurt. We go through shame. And sometimes we do put people in a place where God should be. So our hearts really have been like beaten up. They've gone through a lot. Sometimes I don't even think we know how to love or we feel like we can't love. We can't even give our hearts away. We need God's help with that. We cannot control these hearts of ours. The heart is wicked. We don't even know what's in there. But God sees right into it. And he does surgery on that heart. And he shapes it and he molds it as we give it to him, we have to give him our hearts. And that's what Ezekiel 36, 26 talks about here. And it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. We really can't even love God without his help. 
We need his help to love him. We have hearts that have just been battered. And they might be stony. But God is saying, bring that stony heart here. And let's do an exchange. Let me give you a heart that's going to follow my decrees, follow my laws. Only God can do that. And God wants to do that. So I want to pray for us today. And, and this is God work. I don't know your heart. I am not God. But God sees the heart. These altars are always open. There's people that will come down and pray with you. You feel prompted to do that. But I want to pray that, that God will work in these hearts. And, you know, and this isn't a one-time thing. When we give our hearts to the Lord and we believe in Him and, and we accept that gift of salvation, we surrender our hearts to Him then. But this is a continual thing. Paul, he said it this way. He said, I die daily. We have to constantly give our hearts to the Lord. And he's making us more and more like him. So, Father, we, we pause and we, we pray and we reflect, Father, and we examine, Father, Lord, where you are in our life. Lord, do we have you positioned in the right place? Lord, there's so many distractions in this life, Lord. There's so many things going on. And even after the first service, I heard someone say that life is just so busy, Lord. The business of life, everything gets, gets in the way, Father. But you're telling us to put you first. And Lord, you will put things in order the way they should be. So, Father... Lord, only you know the heart. Lord, we can only see the outside. The man sees the outside, but Lord, you see the heart. You see exactly where we are today, Lord. And you know the need, Lord. And you're more than able to address that. Lord, if we surrender it to you. So I pray in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, we would just offer our hearts to you, Lord. Lord, we can't control these things. Lord, the things that come across these hearts sometimes, Lord... Lord, you know, and you're able to correct, and you're able to shape, you're able to make new, Father, but you ask us to bring them. Even David said, Lord, create in me a new heart, renew a, a, a steadfast spirit within me. Father, I pray this would be a, a ritual for us, Lord. We will offer up our hearts to you, Lord, and allow you to work in it, Lord, and to shape it, Father. And for it to be a space, Lord, that's consecrated, set aside for you. We thank you that you want to do that, Lord. We thank you, Father. Lord, you see into our hearts, and you still want us. You're not scared off, Lord. You're not scared off by what you see in, the, in our hearts, Lord. But you're telling us to come to you so you can fix it. I thank you, Father, that you are the answer. I thank you, Father, that your arms are outstretched, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you see us and you want us, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for this, this service, Lord. We thank you for this time, Lord. Lord, even as we're going our separate ways, Lord, I pray that this will continually be on our minds, Lord, to revere you in our hearts, Lord. It wouldn't just be a message about today, Father, but, Lord, it would be a lifestyle. And, Father, when we do that, Lord, we will proclaim your name, Father. <laughs> we will proclaim your goodness, Father, because you are faithful in every season of our life, Lord. So, Father, as we leave this place today, we pray, Father, you watch over us, Lord. Thank you that you direct our steps, Lord. 
Lord, we pray, Father, throughout this week we'll have time to spend with you, Lord, and to grow in our faith, Lord, and grow in our understanding of your love for us, Lord. Thank you for being with us today. We love you, Lord. And Lord, we're going to reveal you in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.